Hey everybody, welcome to Board Game Heaven. My name is Raymond, and in this video I'll be talking about Super Fantasy Brawl by Jochen Eisenhut, published by Mythic Games. And this is a fantasy arena brawling game for two or four players for ages 14 and up, which plays in about 30 to 45 minutes. It has wonderful minis, some great artwork, some cool components, and it's a really fast-paced arena battle games where you just select a couple of heroes, they each have their own decks, you mash them together and that deck is your deck of cards and you play the actions on those cards. It's pretty easy to explain so I'll start with uh, explaining the rules and uh, teaching you how that works and then I'll give you my final thoughts. Before you start setting up the game, decide which player gets to go first. And you can do that by having each player select their team's color first, and then taking the first player marker, which is double-sided, and simply flip it to see which color gets to go first. And then the other team's player will pick their first hero. So you take the miniature and their corresponding cards, and you just take that to your team. And then the first player selects one of the heroes, and then the second and the first and the second and the first, until each player has a team of three of these heroes and their corresponding cards. And then each deck has their hero's card, which is double-sided. It has a basic version and a leveled up version. And the other cards, there's six for each hero in three colors, are simply uh, mixed together and shuffled, and that will be your drawing deck. Meaning that each player will have a deck of 18 cards. And this is the casual draft. There's also a competitive draft, which is explained in the rulebook. And then, of course, you can take your team's rings and place them on the bottom of your miniatures, so you can easily tell which team belongs to you. And after you've selected your champions, each player takes one of these player boards and then you can place your champion cards on the indicated spots with their basic level up. The other side is their leveled up version. And then you take the three core tokens and you can place those on the indicated spots on the board as well, like so. And then you shuffle your champion's cards and you draw a hand of five cards to start with. And before you start the game, you can always look at your cards and decide if you want to discard some of them or all of them and draw back up to five. And the discarded cards get shuffled back into the deck and then you can start. Next, you can start setting up the board. You simply take the three statues and put them on the indicated spaces on the board and you take and shuffle the challenge deck and then flip over the first card and put it on the first spot in this row. And as game progresses after every round, you will move up these cards following these arrows and reveal a new card, etc. And these cards, if you complete the challenge, will get you a victory point on these spots and two victory points on these spots, then it's one victory point, and here they will get discarded. And in a four player game, you have an extra tile that you put on top of this spot. So that means you put your uh, pile over here and the first card that is revealed is put in this spot. So it takes an extra round before these cards will start earning you some victory points. Place the victory tokens and the damage tokens next to the board, as well as all the trap tokens face down, because these have effects on the other side. Then the first player randomly takes two of those traps without looking at them and places them on two of these six trap hexes. So for example, they could place one here and one here. And then the second player does the same, randomly taking two tokens without looking and placing them on two of those trap hexes. Then the first player places their champions on three out of five of these deployment spots. So for example, they could place them here, here and here. And then the second player does the same. The goal of the game is to be the first player to get five victory points. And you get a victory point by knocking out one of your opponent's champions or by fulfilling these uh, challenge cards at the right time. And all of the miniatures are referred to as champions and the ones on your team are allied champions and the one on the opponent's team are enemy champions. 
and the game uses these magic cores to activate your actions and there's three colors there's the red destruction yellow creation and blue manipulation and anytime you spend an action by using one of those tokens you flip them over indicated that you've used them now each round has three steps. First, it's the first player's turn, then it's the second player's turn, and then you advance the challenge track. And you simply do that by moving all the cards one step forward and turning over the next card from the stack. And as soon as one of these cards reaches the final spot, it is discarded. This is basically the discard pile. And once all of your challenge cards run out and you need to flip over a new one, you shuffle the discard pile to form a new challenge deck. And a player's turn also has three phases. First is the scoreboard phase, then the activation phase and the upkeep phase. So I'll explain those in detail. So during the scoreboard phase, the active player checks to see if they have met the requirements of these challenge cards. And if they do, they check to see if they get any victory points for meeting that requirement. And they take victory points and put them on their side of the board. And since these are always scored at the beginning of a player's turn, that means that their opponent will always have a turn to try and stop them from scoring. Then it's the activation phase and during that active player's turn you can activate your champions by playing action cards that either belong to that champion or by using standard actions which are listed on your player board. So you can play cards in any order and as many as you like as long as you still have the activation cores to activate them. So for example, if you're using a red card over here, and this one is for Goldar, it has his symbol on it, which is also on their card over there, then I can activate my hero, and then I need to spend the red core to activate that card. And you can also activate the same champion multiple times on your turn, as long as you have the cards and the cores to do so. You have to resolve an action card completely before you can use another card. And after you've played all the actions you want to play, it's time for the third step, which is the upkeep phase. And then you ready all of your cores again. So all these spent cores are flipped back over. Then you discard all the cards that you used and that were still on your hand. So your entire hand is discarded. And then you draw five new cards. So let's take a closer look at those action cards. Most of these cards will allow your hero to move and or attack. And your champion may move the number of hexes indicated next to the movement icon, which is this boot. But you can choose to move less than indicated or not at all. Now any hex with a statue or an enemy champion is blocked, so you can't move through them, but you can move through hexes occupied by your allied champions. You just can't end your movement on them. And if you move onto or through a hex with a trap, then that trap will trigger and you flip it over and see what kind of damage your champion gets. Now, not all cards will have a movement printed on them and in that case of course that ability doesn't uh, involve moving your champion and sometimes a hero can have a movement bonus uh, sometimes when they level up they can get an extra movement bonus but that does require uh, a hero to be activated with a movement icon so without this movement icon the movement bonus will not get added. This is also the case when an action requires you to place your champion somewhere. You simply remove it from its current hex and place it somewhere else, but that is not considered to be movement. The next icon on the card is the target of this effect. So in this case, you can see that there are three yellow hexes surrounding the white hex. The white hex is the uh, hex that your champion is standing on and the yellow ones are the possible targets. And you can rotate that any way you want. So a Goldar here could target these three hexes if they had an enemy champion or these three or these three, any way around that you want them to. And there are several different targeting icons. So this is called the area of effect. And you always need to target an enemy champion. So uh, you can't 
target your allied champions unless it's an uh, area of effect this could happen that you're targeting an enemy but an allied champion is also in the same area of effect and then that effect will also be applied to your allied champions there's also the melee attack which simply attacks a single adjacent enemy and then there's also the indirect shot and the direct shot. Now an indirect shot targets also a single enemy and the value next to the icon shows the maximum range of the action. If only one figure is shown, then that means the maximum range. If there's two figures, then there's a minimum and a maximum range. And you always start counting from the hex next to your champion. So in this case, these two champions would be removed two hexes away. So if this was the target, in, in you know, if this was an enemy, then I'd be one, two hexes away, or this way is the same. An indirect shot can target champions through statues or other champions, so you do not need a clear line of sight, so to speak. A direct shot basically works the same, but only in a direct line through the hexes on the board. And that line cannot be blocked by statues or other champions, either allied or enemy champions. Now, after an attack has been declared, so let's say that Goldar here is over here and this champion is over here and I'm attacking that champion. And I'm going to use this card so that champion is within my uh, range. Then the other player may play a reaction card. And reaction cards are indicated with this symbol. So normally a card would have a symbol targeting a specific champion. But the reaction cards do not have a champion symbol. They simply have this white burst on a shield symbol. And you can use that on any of your champions. And to play such a card, the opposing player has to pay the core of that color. So they'd have to have the yellow core and flip it over. And then they could play this card in a reaction to the attack. So in this case, the targeted champion is a Roth. And Roth's card is over here. So Roth has a basic defense of zero in this case. You can see that each hero has a certain defense value. And when a skill deals damage, that's called the strength of the attack, which is the third icon over here. So the strength of this attack is simply one point of damage. And since Roth does not have a, a defense value of his own, he would normally take one damage. But by playing this card, he does get one uh, shield here, so one defense, which means the damage is reduced to zero. This does not work with direct damage. So some skills like this one will have this icon on it, which is the same as those icons on the damage tokens. And that is direct damage. So that cannot be blocked. But the burst symbol, which is the power of the attack, can be blocked with a shield. And then you simply resolve the rest of the actions of these cards. So in this case, the reaction card is resolved first. So in addition to the extra defense value, uh, after the uh, attack, so that's this, this point of damage, uh, this character, this champion, can jump to spaces. And jumping is a keyword, which in this case means that the champion can move two hexes through any obstacle. But if you land on a trap, it is still triggered. But I could move through a statue or an opposing enemy. So in this case, uh, Roth could jump two spots. So let's say uh, one, two over here. And then that card is resolved. And then the rest of this attack card is resolved, which is to push your enemy one spot. But since the enemy has moved out of uh, Goldar's range, that can no longer be done and is simply ignored. And pushing is also one of the keywords that simply, if they were still in range, would push the enemy one, in this case, hex in a straight line away from the attacker. So in this case, that would be in that direction if that spot is free. Now, all of the uh, keywords are explained in the rulebook and there are 18 of those keywords in total. So then after an action is resolved, those cards are discarded. And of course, the uh, core of that color is flipped over. 
and then the active player can choose to do another action. So in this case, they might want to spend their red core here to have a Gwyn there cost Fireball. So the target is two or three hexes away, but first she gets to move one spot. She doesn't have any bonus movement. So in this case, she's gonna just move forward getting uh, that guy over there, Roth, within range of these three hexes, one, two, three. So now she can deal three damage to him. And this time the opponent does not have any more reaction cards. You can only play one reaction card per action, per attack, even if that action, just like we saw with uh, Goldar just now, could potentially target multiple of their uh, champions but they could play another uh, reaction card for the same champion on a second attack. As long as they have the card and the available cores to activate them, of course. So now Roth would take three damage and they can take one of these tokens and these are double sided with one damage and three damage on the other side. You simply place them on the character's card. And this card also has an after attack effect, which deals two direct damage to each champion adjacent to the target, but there are none, so that effect is ignored. There's also an icon that is uh, the flip side of this one, and that means that you resolve this pre-attack. So that means that before dealing that damage, that character does a swoop of three, and swoop is also another keyword. Now, aside from action cards and reaction cards such as these there are also skill cards which are indicated with this gear symbol attack cards and skill cards can only be activated on your own turn and reaction cards are only activated on the opponent's turn and when you activate a skill card again by paying the appropriate core magic you can use as much of the card's movement as you choose and then you choose if you will use the skill and just like with an attack card, you can then choose if you want to use that skill. If you choose not to, then the card ends immediately. And if necessary, you declare a target and resolve the text. And to sum up with a, an attack card, it's basically the same. You can move if there's a movement symbol on it, and then you can move up to that maximum number of movement spaces. Then you uh, have a target, so you declare uh, the target. You resolve any pre-attack abilities, choose if you want to use the attack, and then uh, the opponent can choose to play reaction. And then there's the post-attack icon, which you then resolve. And if you can't use a certain card or you don't want to use a certain card uh, of a specific color, there are always the basic actions. There's four you can take. There's three specific ones for one of each of the colors. So the blue one lets you pick a hero and move that uh, champion one spot. And then it lets you plan a card. So it says plan one, which means you take one card from your hand and put it back on top of your drawing pile, which means that you will draw it at the end of your turn and have it in your hand during the opponent's turn, which could be handy for reaction cards. With the yellow core, you can also move one of your champions one spot and heal that champion one health point. And for the red core, you can move a champion one spot and deal one direct damage to an adjacent enemy to that champion. And the fourth option that you have is to spend any one color, so any color you wish, to move one of your champions up to two spaces. Now, whenever you manage to reduce a hero's health to zero, so let's say my opponent managed to knock out Goyen here, then you take away all of the damage tokens from that card and you take the miniature and place it back into the entrance to the arena. The champion that managed to achieve that is leveled up and that is done by simply flipping over the card you still keep any damage that was on it but now that champion will have an additional ability in this case roth says roth's attacks gain poison one poison is yet another keyword in addition the player controlling that champion also gains one victory point now a champion that is out of action and back in the gate to the arena cannot be targeted by any spells or effects. 
and the player controlling the champion has to reactivate it again by using an action targeting that champion that has a movement icon. So on that player's turn, if they have the required core available, they could play a card that targets that champion that has at least one movement and then use that movement to place it back onto one of the deployment spots. And once in the arena, they can use any remaining movement to move further and complete the rest of that action. Now in this case, uh, Gwayne cannot target anything, but had Roth, for example, been over here, then I could have chosen to deploy Gwayne on this spot, and now I'd have a direct line of sight uh, with, uh, within three to five hexes, so one, two, three, four, which is good, and then I could complete this action and deal three damage, and then afterwards push the target one more spot. And as always, the opponent could still choose to use a reaction card if they have any. Now, should during your turn uh, some activation uh, take out one of your own champions or an allied champion, then the opponent gains one victory point. And if a card takes a champion from each team out simultaneously, then both players gain one victory point and they also level up the appropriate champions. In the rare situation that that would end the game in a draw, then the player who did not play that card wins the game. Now I briefly touched upon the traps here that get triggered whenever a champion moves onto a hex that contains a trap token. And it doesn't matter how the champion ends up there, they could move there themselves, they could be pushed there or some other effect places them on a hex uh, containing a trap. And as soon as a trap is triggered, so for example, let's say Goldar was moved into this uh, trap hex, then you take that uh, token, you flip it over and see what it does. And there are three different kinds of effects. So there's the rooted icon, there's a direct damage icon which either has one, two or three uh, of these direct damage icons on them and there's also the stunned icon. So direct damage is simple enough, you simply take a number of damage tokens and put them on that hero's card if you're rooted, then that champion cannot move anymore, whether they have in a movement on their card or any other effect, they're stuck in place for the remainder of the turn. And when you're stunned, then that means you have to discard a card from that champion from your hand, or if you don't have any left, then you have to show your hand to the opposing player, proving that you don't have any more cards of that champion. There are always four traps on the board, so as soon as a champion takes one of those trap tokens off of the board and triggers it, they take a random new trap from the pool without looking at it and place it on an available trap hex. Now in this case, that's only this hex over here, but if they are all taken either by traps or by characters, then you can place a trap on any hex adjacent to a trap uh, hex. So for example, I could place it over here. And after you've done that and resolved the uh, trigger trap, you place that one back into the pool and flip it over and then give that a little a bit of a shuffle. And that is basically it. So the rule book does go into more detail on all of these actions and specifically the uh, keywords on the cards. And there's also a four player variant, which is called Super Team Tornado, where you play in teams of two players versus two players and each player controls two champions. So you have four champions on each team and you play with only a card hand of four. So the maximum cards four and you win by reaching seven victory points instead of five. You also use a token that you place on the challenge track over here, making it one step longer. So that means your challenge cards are over here and you simply get more steps before they are discarded. This also means that each player will only have 12 cards in their champion's deck and the play order is from team one, the first player, then team two, the first player, team one, the second player, team two, the second player, and so forth. And after all players have taken their turn, you resolve the next uh, champion card. You flip a new one over and move these up just like normal. And there are also rules on how you can draft your heroes before starting the game. And that is basically it. The rulebook also has an overview page with all of the keywords that you can uh, check out. 
And that's uh, all you need to know on how to play Super Fantasy Brawl. Let's go to my final thoughts. So my final thoughts on Super Fantasy Brawl by Mythic Games. Let's start with the components. So the components are amazing as you have seen in the video and perhaps also in my unboxing video. They're phenomenal. You, the first thing that you see obviously are the minis. These are so cool. They're big and chunky on big bases and all the bases are sculpted. You can see all the detail. They're very detailed, very nice and big and just I can imagine these are lovely to paint. I've seen pictures online of people who had already painted all of them. It's phenomenal. This is just so cool. Really looks really nice on the board. So that is just the first thing that you notice. But also all the other components. I mean, the board is beautiful. Really love the art. Clear colors, clear hexes. Everything is just very clear. It makes sense. You have all the icons for where to put these challenge cards and where to put your characters when you deploy them. You have the different colors surrounding the statues and where the statues are, are also printed on the board. It all totally makes sense. Then there's the cards. The cards are of a good quality. Now I've sleeved them with the sleeves that I received, but uh, the cards themselves are a decent thickness, pretty standard, and uh, they have a glossy finish, but the colors on them are very clear so that's pretty nice as well then you've got you know your tokens the regular the, the retail edition will have all of these cardboard tokens which are nice over a very good standard cardboard thickness for tokens with clear uh, printed iconography on them that also makes sense and you also have those for the three uh, actions that you can take in the three colors and the other side will have no color so that means you've exhausted it and that just is very clear now of course the kickstarter version did have all of these really lovely plastic uh, tokens that are also a lot of fun to use and really cool i mean the 3d uh, trophies here the victory points are cool but the standard edition comes with these which have an orange and a purple side to them so you can use them for either team so those are great as well as well as the traps the traps are also very clear you can clearly see that this is a trap and on the other side you can clearly see what they do so that works as well uh, whereas you know the plastic ones are pretty cool it's clear that it's a trap and on the other side because it's not painted you have to really look what's there so you know people have been painting these as well so in that regard maybe having the tokens is not such a bad idea because you know they're instantly clear they're full color and these you're probably gonna have to paint although you know you don't you don't really need to paint these would look nice but uh you know they're trophies so that's that's fine the artwork is also really, really good. I love the artwork. I love the style. You know, it's fantasy. It's fun. Uh, they're also the very the chunkiness of the minis uh, is very clear in the art as well. You know, the, the big strong lines, the, the bright colors. It just looks really nice. I love the artwork for all of this game. It's really well done. So the theme is also really nice. It's generic fantasy, of course, but it looks lovely. It, you know, you know, have, have all these cool, fantastic creatures with their fantastic arts, duking it out in the arena, using all kinds of skills and even magic and all kinds of stuff. And that just works really well. It's not very original, but for this kind of game, I love that. So I really like the theme. It's basically just fighting fantasy figures and that's it. So there's not a whole lot to it. There's not a huge story behind it or anything, but it works. It's a fantasy brawler game and that's just what it is. And I like it. So let's talk about the gameplay. Well, gameplay is very simple and very fun. The rules are easy. The, they are quick to teach and quick to learn. And basically what you do is you pick three heroes, doesn't matter which ones, you can either select them, you know, one by one and, you know, make your team the team that you want to have or just randomly pick them. Even if you don't know what all the different heroes do, just pick three that you like 
And that's it really. And then you take their cards and they only have six cards each, two of each color. And then you have three of those decks for each of your hero. There's one deck, so you have three decks. And you just mash them together, shuffle that, and that's your deck of 18 cards. That's it. You draw five cards in your hand and go. And then you take one blue action, one red action, one yellow action in any order. And that's it. And if you can't play one of those actions because you happen to not have a card of that color or the card of a certain color that you have can't be played right now or just isn't very helpful, then you can always use the three basic skills that are also printed on your character board right there and use those instead, you know, to just simply, you know, uh, you can plan, which is great. You can put a card that you can't use right now, but would be handy in the other player's turn back on top of the deck. So, you know, you'll draw that at the end of your game of your turn and have that card in your hand, you know, to potentially block an attack or something. You can heal your hero, you know, get some damage. And let's see what else. There was one lets you uh, deal one damage to an adjacent enemy, exactly. Or you can use either color to move two spaces. So those are the basic actions you can always take so you're never out of options. But it's usually a lot of fun to just look at your cards and then decide, okay, so which of these cards am I going to use? So for example, the blue action, am I going to use this card or that card or the basic action? And will I do that one first or will I do the red one first or perhaps the yellow one first? And you're trying to figure out in which order to optimally use those cards to do as much damage as you can or to position your heroes most favorably so that you will be you know next to a statue when your turn starts so you can get those victory points from those uh, challenge cards because these are a lot of fun these challenge cards basically tell you to do something or be in a certain position and you know they slide along the board and they first they're zero points then one victory point then two then another round then they're two and then they're one and then they're destroyed so you have a limited window in which to activate them and if you time it correctly you'll get two victory points and you only need five to win so it's going to be over really quick so it's a very tense game you really want to move around quickly and it's not even about trying to knock out your opponent's team because they will just respawn and get back into the game that will get you one victory point so if you can you know if there's an opportunity to do so <clears throat> do it but the most points can be earned with those challenge cards so if you can combine it somehow just focus on those that might even be the better choice to do. And your cards will help you do it. And that's it. That it, The idea is just so simple. It's brilliant. It's really a beautiful, beautiful game. And I love it. And I just love how fast it plays. And, you know, it plays in about half an hour to 45 minutes, maybe. And if you're new to the game, maybe an hour. But you'll figure it out really fast. I mean, there's only six cards per hero, so you'll know exactly what that hero can do very fast. After having played one game, you'll know, well, this hero does this and this hero does that. And I can combine those to do certain actions. And you might want to try that again. Or you might think, well, this didn't work very well. Maybe I'm going to try that hero because that hero can do this and that, which will work better with this combination. There's just so much to try out and it's a lot of fun, but it's not difficult at all because there's only six cards per hero. So you'll figure it out quick and you'll want to try all different combinations to find out their synergies. And that is a lot of fun to me. I really like that. And that keeps the game fast paced and intense. And it's really, you know, going for those points. Most of the games that I played were really, really tight. It was just a matter of one turn for one or the other player to win. So it's, it feels very, very balanced. And because the game is so fast paced and over relatively quickly, you're going to want to play again and perhaps with different teams and again and again. So the replayability is very good here. You have, you know, uh, the, the, there's, in the retail edition, I think you get six heroes. In this Kickstarter edition, we got already 12 because we unlocked additional heroes. And there's the first expansion pack with three 
additional heroes. And there is a Kickstarter right now going on that you can find if you click the link in the description below or the I in the corner of this video. And that will take you to that uh, Kickstarter where they will have two more new expansion packs with three heroes each, adding six more heroes to this game. So replayability is great and the Mythic Games will just add more and more expansion packs with new heroes uh, month, quarterly, I think. I'm not sure at which intervals they're going to release them, but there is going to be plenty. So that is awesome. Big replayability. Now there is one negative point to the game and that is that it is unfortunately language dependent. The cards have text on them, they have certain skills that are you know, written in English or in French. There's an English and a French edition. I don't know if there are additional languages, I didn't look it up, but uh, maybe there are, maybe there will be in the future, I don't know. But uh, that is something to take into account because if it's not available in your language, uh, the language that you prefer, you might have to you know, get the English version and that means you need to have a firm grasp of the English language, even though there is not a whole lot of text on the cards and most of the text is basically just uh, these, these key words that are explained in the rules. So once you get those key words down and you know what they mean, the game isn't really that hard anymore if it's you know not in a language that you're you know, that's your own. Because, you know, you learn those keywords pretty fast. And then, you know, the rest is icons, because, you know, these cards have clear icons for movement, for targeting, for the amount of damage that they do, if you trigger it before or after an attack. And it just uses, so this one, for example, has dash two, bloodied, and double. And those are all explained in the rules. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that people with a basic knowledge of English will be able to play this game, but it's there and it is something to keep in mind. And that's basically it. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mythic Games for sending over this copy to review. It's really very much appreciated. I had a lot of fun with this and I will continue to have a lot of fun with this, I'm sure. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video as well. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. And please also consider becoming a Patreon saint to my channel to support what I do by visiting my Patreon page. You can click the link in the description below or the icon at the end of this video that will take you to my page where you can read how you can support my channel and you'll get your name in the credits of all of my videos as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on Board Game Heaven.